In this video, I'm going to continue my journey to find the perfect YouTube studio camera, this time looking at the Panasonic EVA-1. Here's a story. The Panasonic EVA-1, more affectionately known as EVA, was released in late 2017 and is a 5.7K cinema camera with a super 35mm sensor. It boasts 14 stops of dynamic range, dual native ISO of 800 and 2500, and the same colour science found in the Vericam camera systems. It has an EF mount, so you can use all your EF lenses on this system. In the studio, I typically use the Sigma 18-35mm f1.8, and then when I'm outside and need that extra reach, I'll use the Canon 70-200 f2.8. This camera also has built-in NDs, letting you reduce the light by 2, 4 and 6 stops. These won't necessarily be that useful inside, but outside they are very handy to get that shallow depth of field without needing to crank your shutter. It has a removable LCD monitor, we'll get back to that later, and has all the functions you'd expect from a cinema camera. Focus peaking, waveform, assignable buttons, shutter angle, built-in XLR inputs, full HDMI out, SDI out, timecode in and out, electronic image stabilization, which is all right, and more. So with all that said, let's see what the footage looks like in the studio. And this is what it looks like in the studio. Currently we're recording in Ultra HD, 10 bit. We're recording in Vlog as well. The ISO is set to 800 and we're using the Sigma 18 to 35 F 1.8 at F 2.8. So this is what the image looks like in a typical YouTube studio setup. Right now I am recording straight to the camera using the Panasonic V90 cards. This card is 128 gigabytes and with that, you can get approximately 170 minutes recording in 8-bit in Ultra HD at 25p. And then you can get 113 minutes when recording in 10-bit in Ultra HD 25p. So between the 8 and 10-bit color depths, you do see a significant reduction in file sizes. So that's something to keep in mind when you're recording these pieces in your studio. If you don't feel like you need to have that extra 10-bit color space, then recording in 8-bit might be a good solution for you just to minimize file sizes. And they're not needing to worry about having lots of SD cards or having lots of hard drives to back up all your footage, depending on whatever backup system you have. Sometimes you might be recording projects and you don't need to keep all the raw footage that you're recording. So you might choose to record in 10-bit because you aren't going to keep the footage anyway and having those big file sizes for one-off projects aren't really a big hassle for you. Now you don't need to have this special V90 card that I'm using right now. I actually got this card as part of a promo when I purchased the EVA one. Luckily, these cards are quite expensive and normally I wouldn't go out of my way to purchase one, but since I have one, I use it. What I do like about this card though is when I'm dumping my footage back onto the computer, the transfer speeds are a lot faster than what I get from my normal SanDisk V30 cards. So the V30 cards I get normally 90 megabytes a second transfer speed and then with these Panasonic V90 cards I typically get around 250 megabytes per second. So if you do want to save that time in transferring those large files this might be a good purchase for you but you do have to weigh up the cost between the two types of cards. One is under $100 the other is multiple hundreds of dollars. Luckily for me I've already got the card so I just use it and I do find it to be a great time saver. One thing to take note about with the EVA 1, when you're changing frequencies with the camera, so going from 25p to 50p or 24p to 50p or whatever, the default codec that the EVA 1 defaults to, a lot of the time is the 8-bit version or the lower version codec. Nine times out of 10, I'm shooting Vlog and I wanna be recording in the 10-bit 422 codec. And unfortunately, when I change from 25p to then shoot maybe some B-roll in 50p, the main codec then goes to the 420 long gop, which is the 8-bit codec. Ideally, I'd rather have it either remember what I had it set on last time or just default to the 10-bit 422 long gop codec instead of the smaller 8-bit codec. The reason I mention this is because sometimes when you're shooting, you think about, oh, I need to change my frame rate, but then you don't actually think about, oh, I need to change my codec as well, or double check what the codec is. And I have been caught out a few times shooting Vlog, 
changing the frequency from 25p to 50p and then shooting in 8-bit. And I don't want to be shooting in 8-bit when I'm recording vlog because I want to be shooting in 10-bit to have that extra color space and extra data. So when I put the vlog footage into Premiere Pro, I actually have extra room to manipulate the image and get a nicer image overall. Yes, you can record vlog in 8-bit, but I wouldn't recommend it because it doesn't necessarily give you the room to have the best possible image in the end. Evil One also has a bunch of different color settings or looks built into the camera. Typically, I use vlog most of the time. However, if I don't want to be shooting in log and I want a nice, pleasing image straight out of the camera, I'll flick over to scene two. Right now we're shooting in vlog, so let's just swap over to scene two now just to show you what it looks like. And now this is what scene two looks like in the studio. Uh, do you see much of a difference? Do you like this look better? This is the default look coming straight out of the camera. If you want, you can dive into the settings and then change around a whole bunch of stuff until your heart's content just to get that perfect out of camera look that you want. So if that's something that's important to you, the Eva one has you covered. Moving on to battery and powering options. I'm just gonna look down at my notes here. I use the Core SWX Nano VBR98 HDV battery for the Panasonic EVA 1, which features a PTAP out, which I specifically got to then be able to power my monitor on the EVA 1. Now, the interesting thing is I specifically purchased this battery because of that one feature and I've never used it. I actually don't have the battery cable that goes from the battery to my monitor to power it. And then also, I figured that with this battery, it does allow you to run the EVA 1 by itself from four to five hours with one charge. And then the monitor would then be draining from that, then reducing that runtime. And I'd rather have that extra runtime available and then run the external monitor off the Sony batteries, which I have plenty of. and just have that extended runtime in operating my camera. When you're running the monitor and the camera off the one single battery, you'll then have to change over batteries more often, meaning I'd have to probably buy another battery on top of that. So that's why I still haven't used that feature out of this battery. It's still a great battery. It has great runtime. It also has a power indicator, which gives you a rough idea of how much battery is left in the battery without having to plug it into the camera to check manually. So I find that really helpful too. And overall, really happy with this battery, but in a studio setting, I would definitely recommend just using the 12 volt DC power cable that comes with the battery charger. That plugs straight into the camera, and then you can just have continuous power running straight to the EVA and recording yourself in the studio without needing to swap over batteries or worry about how much battery life you've got left in your camera. One thing to note for live streamers as well is that this camera has HDMI out and you can get a clean feed from that. So you don't have to worry about having any info displays showing up on your feed. EVA 1 has you covered. Also, if you want to be able to control the EVA 1 through a smart device, you can do that. However, you do need to purchase a Wi-Fi module. That Wi-Fi module is the AJWM50. And unfortunately, I don't have one of these modules. And the main reason that I don't have one is because of the price. It's $160 US to be able to purchase. And because of the price tag, I just haven't found myself ordering it and then needing to use it. I've just been able to get by without needing that extra function. One thing that I like about the Panasonic S1 is you can just turn the Wi-Fi option on and then download the free app and then bam, you've got it. You can control the camera. The fact that there's an extra barrier in needing to have that Wi-Fi module and you need to pay for it, it's really just derailed the whole process of being able to control this camera remotely. As I said, I don't really need it, but it would be fairly handy in a YouTube studio. So I'm just letting you know the feature is there, but I'm not using it. One thing that I do like about the Evil One though is the square focus assist function. The first time I saw this, I thought, oh my goodness, this is so distracting, I'm never going to use this. But after giving it a go a few times, I quickly found myself finding this to be my preferred way of checking focus and getting that critical focus. Along with using the expanded zoom function as well, whenever you zoom in on your subject, you can then see, is it actually in focus? And then having those boxes there as well really does assist in getting that critical focus. Now, the way that these boxes work, the bigger the box, the more you know you're nailing your focus. 
as long as the boxes are showing up on what you actually want in focus. If you've got a whole bunch of boxes on the background and you're actually wanting the subject sitting in front of you to be in focus, which is probably going to be the case, then you need to make sure that there's more boxes on your subject and not the background. You might have some boxes kind of small on the background. That's just saying eh, it's starting to get a little bit in focus. But as long as the main boxes are big on your subject, then you know that your subject is in focus. And then just to double check that it is in focus, you can push one of your user assigned buttons as well to expand your zoom and then punch in and see, ah yes, it is actually in focus. So those are the two focus assist functions that I use together just to make sure I've got that critical focus. Now, this leads me to the first of two biggest letdowns that I have with the Evil One. Number one, there is no continuous autofocus. So for some people, you might be rolling your eyes right now and thinking, oh, I don't need continuous autofocus. Manual focus is fine. But having continuous autofocus when you're recording yourself in a YouTube studio, I find is a really handy feature to have. Right now I'm recording in manual focus and I hope I am in focus. I did do a test before, checked it on the computer, I should be in focus, but sometimes you might move back, you might move forward, and just having that continuous autofocus really does give you that peace of mind knowing that you are in focus as long as the camera system has a reliable autofocus function. Now when I was looking at purchasing the Evil One, there was one other camera that was pretty much in my price range that I could have got and that was the Canon C200. Obviously, as you can tell, I did end up going with the Evil One, but the main thing that the Canon C200 had over the Evil One was their dual pixel autofocus. And at the time, I ended up just deciding, you know what, there's no perfect camera, I'm just gonna have to compromise and go with the Evil One. And I ended up going with the Evil One because it had 10-bit, it had V-Log, it had 14 stops of dynamic range, it had dual ISO. It had so many features and ticked so many boxes that I had to be the camera that would work best for me. The only thing that the C200 had that was important to me that the Evil One didn't have was dual pixel autofocus. So at the end of the day, I ended up just having to make that decision and I ended up purchasing the Evil One. And now the second biggest letdown that I have with the Evil One is its LCD screen. It's a 3.5 inch touch screen, which isn't very responsive with its touch features, unfortunately. So I ended up using just the wheel on the side of the camera body to navigate through menus. But if you've ever used the Evil One and taken it outside, you'll realize very quickly that the screen that you're supposed to be monitoring what you're filming just looks like a mirror. It is so reflective and so dull that you can't see what you're actually recording. Now the workaround to this is have an external monitor and that's what I've done. I remember shooting an event during summer a couple of years ago and it was a sunny day, there was people outside, I was shooting outside and I could barely see the image coming from the EVA. At that time, I was thinking, oh, an external monitor is really just an optional extra. And I quickly learned that it is not an optional extra, it is a necessity. So if you're shooting outside with the Panasonic EVA 1, I 100% recommend that you get a five inch external monitor. Yes, you can get a seven inch monitor if you want a bigger screen as well and you're happy with that size, but I find the five inch screen is more than enough and you've also got to make sure that it is daylight viewable. So I've used a couple of monitors. I've used the Portkeys LH5, which has 1500 nits of brightness. And right now I also use the Atomos Shinobi, which has a thousand nits of brightness. And right now you might be thinking, what does nits mean? That doesn't mean anything to me. Just so you know, anything that's 800 nits or higher is classified as daylight viewable. The higher the number, the brighter the image is going to be, but then also keep in mind, the faster the battery is going to drain as well. So I find anywhere between 1000 and 1500 nits is more than enough for me to go outside and record stuff in sunlight. And the main reason that I use the Shinobi these days is because it's the SDI version as well. And the reason that I use the Atomos Shinobi SDI version is because I wanna be able to use the square focus assist feature. Now, when you're using the HDMI out from the Evo One, it doesn't actually send that focus assist function out to the monitor. It has to be over SDI. I'm not quite sure why, but that's just something to take note of and be aware of. 
So overall, is this the perfect YouTube Studio camera? No, it's not the perfect YouTube Studio camera and I'll tell you why. There's no continuous autofocus, so we've covered that, all right, that makes it a deal breaker. If there isn't continuous autofocus, I can't recommend it as being the perfect YouTube Studio camera for a YouTube Studio. And the second reason is the price. This is a professional cinema camera which has a lot of functions that you honestly don't really need in a YouTube studio environment. So if you're just recording yourself talking to camera, having the Panasonic EVA 1 might be a little bit of overkill. However, if you then take this camera out of the studio and start recording B-roll, then all these extra features that the Panasonic EVA 1 has might start to become a benefit to you. However, if the camera is only going to live on a tripod, I think a lot of the features are going to just go to waste and you're paying a premium for things that you're just not going to use. The good news is there are plenty of other cameras to look at that are cheaper than the Panasonic EVA 1. I haven't found the perfect camera yet, but hopefully it's not too far away. And that'll do it for this video. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to this channel for more videos on video creation in the future.